I think, therefore I am. But I'm thinking all the time, and I don't know who I am. Am I? Are you? I'm in the middle of nowhere, and it's a good place to be. Welcome to Just Nowhere with Dr. Samuel Zinner. Hello, everyone. Today we'll be talking with uh, Professor Gregory Chaitin at, uh, from the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, Gregory, or shall I call you Greg? Sure. Sure. So, all right, Greg. Um, let's give a little background. Uh, I'm presently I'm co-editing a volume, a forthcoming volume, uh, on the origins and applications of language and number for uh, Roman and Littlefield. Uh, with the opening chapter from Noam Chomsky. And Greg is also contributing a chapter. And uh, we'll be speaking with you today. Uh, and I'll ask you some questions pertinent to that chapter that, that you've already finished for us. And so the first one deals with digital philosophy, right? So you start your paper, uh, I believe, with this little nice quip, according to Pythagoras, Everything is number. God is a mathematician, right? But according to what you would call a, a neo-Pythagorean uh, ontology, right? Everything is algorithm and God is um, a programmer, right? All right. So that's the introduction, right? So that to the question of what is digital philosophy, which starts with uh, the uh, philosopher Leibniz. So... Um, before you tell us what digital philosophy is, um, tell us who this Leibniz is, because apparently it starts with him and his binary system. Yeah, well, uh, Leibniz is a remarkable thinker, not that well known um, compared to other philosophers. Uh, he was what is called a universal genius. He was interested in everything. And um, um, one of the things, just one of the things that Leibniz did was to invent the calculus. And he had a horrendous priority dispute with Newton over that Newton accused him of plagiarism. Um, so, um, so Leibniz, in addition to being a, a deep philosopher, uh, was a formidable mathematician and in fact, he was good at everything. He was curious and he would go like a butterfly from field to field, throwing out fundamental ideas as he went and rarely taking the trouble to develop them in detail. But you can see anticipations of many modern developments in his writings from 300 years ago. And um, uh, at that time, uh, people didn't publish First of all, not very much. First of all, publishing was dangerous. You could be accused of being a heretic. Uh, so, for example, people would publish under a pseudonym very often. You had to have a, a duke or someone uh, approve of the publication. There were modern journals. I think there might have been one, Le Journal de Savant. There were very few. And in fact, what intellectuals did is they would send letters to each other. So this was called the Republic of Letters. And uh, these letters very often would go through intermediaries. For example, Mersenne, a, a priest, was a, such a, a, a man. And so you have to go through Leibniz's papers, through the letters, uh, to see his ideas. And when he died, he left an enormous mass of paper, maybe 10 pages or 20 pages a day. And fortunately, they were preserved, and people going through them, discovered wonderful things. And one of the things that they discovered is, uh, is Leibniz's ideas on digital philosophy. But um, Leibniz is also one of the inventors of the calculating machine. Pascal had made an adding machine, and uh, Leibniz did a, made a design for a machine that could multiply, that had some mechanical problems, but I think it sort of worked. And as a result of that, he showed the machine at the Royal Society in London and was named a, a foreign member. 
Uh, Leibniz studied mathematics late. He learned it with, uh, I'm mispronouncing his Christian Huygens, the mathematical, the Dutch mathematical physicist, was in Paris, and Leibniz spent a few years in Paris where uh, Huygens taught him mathematics. Huygens realized that he was a very talented young man, but mathematicians usually start even, even earlier. But, um, um, and, um, so, so, so Leibniz made a calculating machine, realized that calculating machines could be very valuable in automating uh, thinking. You see, a machine that could add and could multiply was the artificial intelligence project of the time. This was a period where I think most people couldn't read or write, maybe only priests could. And to be able to multiply already was considered a high intellectual achievement. So uh, this was an advanced artificial intelligence project, and that's why it impressed people so much at the Royal Society in London that it got him a foreign membership before the feud with Newton soured Leibniz's relation with the uh, relationship with the Royal Society. So Leibniz also realized, and now we're going in the direction of binary arithmetic, mm -hmm. that um, that if you, well, this, let me tell you the story of how Leibniz gets involved with binary arithmetic. There was a Jesuit priest in Beijing, uh, his name escapes me, att attempting to see uh, if um, Chinese philosophy was compatible in any way with uh, Catholicism. Mm. He was, um, you know, the Jesuits are the intellectuals of the Roman Catholic Church. They're brilliant, they're brilliant men, usually, very brilliant men. And Leibniz was exchanging letters with this Jesuit priest in Beijing, and um, he was very curious to know what China was like and what they thought. And one of the things that the, um, the, his Jesuit correspondent told him about was the I Ching, which I believe hmm. is um, two to the sixth possible combinations used for a divination. So yes. you, it's, a, it's a zero one thing. I don't know what you do. You don't toss a coin, but it's something like that. Six, six. times. Yeah, and that gives you a, a two to the six possibilities, which is 64 possibilities as an answer to uh, a question. This is a form of a divination. And when Leibniz heard this, he immediately realized that you could write numbers just with zeros and ones, with just two possibilities rather than, than 10 digits. And he thought the Chinese surely must have thought of this idea but a Chinese scholar from Beijing that I met once in Sweden, um, who was, a, by the way, an expert on Leibniz, uh, assured me that Leibniz invented binary arithmetic, that in China Ooh. this idea, in spite of the I Ching, had not occurred to anyone. So Leibniz realizes that zero and one are enough to represent numbers, but he goes a little further than this. and. Um, I would, I, I, I may be over, uh, overreacting, but my belief is that Leibniz had a vision that the world could be built out of, I would put it in modern terms, could be will, built out of information rather than being built out of matter and energy. Now, this was a long time ago. Modern science was just beginning. By the way, Leibniz was also a physicist um, uh, he, he was one of the creators of the idea of kinetic energy, which had not occurred to Newton. And the idea of energy is a very sophisticated notion with an interesting history. Mm -hmm. so, um, so Leibniz knew about the, the mechanistic philosophy, it was called then, which was the beginnings of modern physics. But, but he realized I think it's pretty clear that zeros and ones could represent anything. Um, he proposed to his duke, his patron, he served various dukes of Hanover, um, and he proposed to his patron at that time, the Duke of Hanover, who was later to become, with Leibniz's help, the King of England, because there was no heir to the throne, he proposed to the duke that the duke should strike a medallion commemorating the discovery of binary arithmetic uh, and with the duke's 
image portrait, the Duke's portrait on one side and um, binary arithmetic on the other. And there are various designs for this medallion that he proposed to the Duke. The Duke did not did not accept Leibniz's proposal. Uh, there are various designs for this um, medallion it, among the Leibniz papers. Some of them are in German. Some of them are in Latin. You were kind enough, Samuel, to send me one in German. And what's interesting is it, it shows the numbers from my, maybe it's uh, 1 to 16 mm -hmm. in, in binary and in decimal. And then it shows an example of addition, an example of multiplication in binary. But it has more than that. It, it's at the top, it says the one has created everything from nothing, and in Latin or in German, um, in German, what is it? Einer hat alles uh, von nichts gemacht. I think it's something like aus that. Nichts gemacht, also von aus nichts. Probably aus nichts. Yeah. And in Latin, it's a, a similar, this, the idea is the same. And underneath, it says something very interesting. In German, it's something like Bildung der Schopfung, which is image of the creation or picture of the creation. And in Latin, it's Imago Creationis, mm -hmm. image of the creation. Yes. And there are some mystical or theological references in the medallion. There is the sun with lots of rays coming from the sun. There are the stars. Um, uh, so, so the, there are two ways of interpreting the one has everything created from nothing. One is that God has created everything out of emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. Or that with the one, with the bit one, with the digit one and the digit zero, you can create every number. But yes. Leibniz is going, it, it's by saying this is the image of the creation and 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 putting a clear reference to monotheistic God in there and the creation of the world. I think that uh, maybe I'm fooling myself, but Leibniz is imagining that the world could be built just out of information, out of a symbolic representation. And um, this is actually an active area of research in contemporary physics, where people are trying to see, real physicists are trying to see if they can build the world out of what's called quantum information, which is a little more sophisticated version of the zeros and ones that Leibniz was talking about. But it's the same vision. It's the vision that maybe matter and energy are not the fundamental, as in you normally think in physics, that space, uh, Time, matter, and energy are the fundamental things from which you build yes. the physical yeah. world. Yes. But when you're thinking about computers and computation, um, you build the world out of information, out of zeros and ones, which represent either data or algorithms. And um, um, I'm sorry, uh, there was something I meant to say here. Let me, let me. Try to catch my thought here. Um, I've lost the thread. Um, well, better just continue and, and try to recover. Um, so, um, yes, you were just making the point that digital, uh, according to modern physics, we usually see space, time, energy, right, as the fundamentals. Uh, but according to digital philosophy, that it's uh, information, right, and you right. With, with yeah, now I remember what I meant to say. Uh, Leibniz has a remark somewhere that as God cogitates and computes and calculates, so the world is made. So this is the idea that the world is made out of calculation by computing, you see. And yes. um, um, so that's an... Even Elon Musk makes a remark like this recently in an interview that he wanted to study the most fundamental things and he realized that theoretical physics was very fundamental. But he makes a, 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 an intriguing remark that in some ways uh, information and computation are even more fundamental. 
Uh, mm -hmm. He doesn't say more about that. But you see, all of us who have worked with computers, um, you see, traditional mathematics, when you, do, when you do mathematical physics, you use um, the calculus, you use continuous mathematics in, in theoretical physics. But now that everything is calculated on the computer, um, one realizes that um, mathematics can be done discreetly and, and via algorithms and software. So this gives you an alternative way of describing the universe, perhaps, in terms of, of the computations uh, that are done. Um, so, so, so this is an idea that, as you said, if, instead of God being a mathematician and everything being number, perhaps everything is, in, is algorithm and God is a programmer, program the universe. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a vision, this is an ontology, this is a theoretical speculation, sort of at the level of the pre-Socratics, th this view. And um, I'm intrigued by it uh, because I'm one of the creators of one of the versions of information theory called algorithmic information, which yes. combines the computer with information and studies their interaction. There are is Shannon information, which is statistical communications theory. There is Boltzmann entropy, which is a notion of information in statistical physics. And the kind of information I like uh, is, is close to, closer to Leibniz's interests and to this vision of digital philosophy. Mm -hmm. So in other words, instead of a materialist view of the world, there's the idealist view. Instead of the world being a big machine, the world would be a big idea in the mind of God, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if the world is an idea rather than built out of matter and energy, then it would be built out of information probably, right? It's an idea. That's what, in, that's what ideas are made from, from information. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so I think this is an intriguing idea. Um, you see, information digital information has been revealed in this past century to be very fundamental. On the one hand, we have computer technology, which has completely transformed our lives, right? Nobody yes. could imagine living without a cell phone at hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have molecular biology, which is built on a kind of digital information, which is DNA. That's the fundamental notion in modern biology. It's, it's molecular mm -hmm. biology and it's DNA and it's discrete and it's a it's like a digital programming language it's people say DNA is the software of life and that's a very fertile metaphor so and um, I've proposed um, follow, building on some ideas of Leibniz from 1686 on complexity um, that are other ideas, the fascinating fertile ideas of Leibniz's uh, mm -hmm. from his digital philosophy proposal. Um, I've proposed the notion of looking at epistemology uh, as information theory, which would give uh, algorithmic information theory, would give these ideas a sort of a fundamental status um, philosophically. That's the idea that what a physical theory is, it used to be thought of as an equation, Mm -hmm. But maybe the, uh, another way of thinking about a physical theory is that it's software for calculating uh, the results of experiments or, or yes. calculating the time evolution of the universe, if you want to be very ambitious yes. and imagine uh, computing everything, the whole universe as a computation. So you can also think of a mathematical theory as software, as a computation, uh, following Hilbert's idea of a completely formal axiomatic theory um, where you have a, a set of axioms written in symbolic logic using mathematical logic and you apply rules of inference and you deduce all possible consequences of the axioms, which are the theorems, Hilbert thought there would be a theory of everything for mathematics. And this would be software. This would be a, is a equivalent to a calculation which never stops, which goes through the tree of all possible deductions from the axioms, getting all the consequences, all the theorems. And so you can also think about, in both cases, you can measure the complexity of 
a physical theory or a mathematical theory in terms of the number of bits of software. And this idea actually can tra trace back through Hermann Weil, a wonderful mathematician and yes. student of, of Hilbert's, by the way, his best student, uh, to, to Leibniz in 1686. Hermann Weil realized that in 1686, Leibniz has a, a manuscript which we call the Discours de Metaphysique. Uh, it's in French and it's in English, it's the Discourse on Metaphysics. This was a manuscript discovered about a century after Leibniz's death among his papers. And it's a relatively short manuscript. In it, among other things, there is a proposal for kinetic energy, which mm. is a very good idea. And there are also some comments in paragraphs, uh, I think, is it five and six? On complexity and simplicity, very deep comments that Hermann Weil discovered he, he discovered these remarks and realized how deep and how important they were. And I learned of Leibniz's ideas on complexity by reading Hermann Weil. Weil, has, mm -hmm. Weil was a wonderful mathematician. He published a number of books on mathematics. He published two very influential books on mathematical physics, one on uh, relativity, on general relativity, space, time, yes. and matter in German, yes. of course. And he has a book on... I think it's group theory and quantum mechanics that was also very influential. And he has, he has a book on aesthetics, but he has two books on, on an art. He has two books on philosophy. The, the best known one is called Philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Science, I believe. Mm -hmm. The version I'm aware of is in English. It's 1949, it's Princeton University Press, but it was originally in German and the Princeton University Press version was expanded with many very interesting appendices. That's what I read as a student. And he has a shorter book called The Open World, which are three lectures he gave in 1932 at Yale University in New Haven. And in both places, he refers to Leibniz's ideas on complexity in the Discours de Metaphysique. So uh, that's how I realized that I should study Leibniz. Mm. And I, so you can trace back this idea of the importance of the notion of the complexity of a physical theory, um, which uh, philosophers like Popper has yes. a whole chapter in his book, The Logic of uh, Scientific Discovery on simplicity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I've done, my, my own research efforts were to take this idea of complexity and apply it to mathematical theories where it's a little less obvious. Mm -hmm. um, in physical theories, everyone has, has spoken about simplicity and complexity as being important, people like Mach and Poincaré. But in mathematics, uh, that was a, a new application of these ideas. <clears throat> and I've attempted to, to have a... Um, there's a famous result of Kurt Gödel in 1931, which basically pulls the rug from, out from under Hilbert's proposal that there yes. can be a single theory of everything for all of pure mathematics. This is Gödel's famous incompleteness theorem, which is proved in a deeper way in 1936 by Alan Turing using the notion of computation. And I have proofs um, in, involving a notion of complexity of, of, in terms of algorithmic information or bits of software where where I can sort of say that the world, the platonic world of pure mathematics has infinite complexity of this kind of specific complexity, but any mathematical theory, any formal axiomatic theory of the kind that Hilbert proposed only has finite complexity and therefore can only capture an infinitesimal part of, of all this, of all this mathematical truths. Yes. So these are, these are successively stronger versions of a refutation of an idea that mathematicians still believe in, in their hearts. Um, yes. This notion that there's a theory of everything for pure mathematics is so dear to the hearts of mathematicians, it's like a religion. Yes. Because what it says, as Hilbert pointed out, is that this is what it means to say that mathematics is objective and provides absolute certainty. He said, if this is the case, then there must be a formal axiomatic theory for all of mathematics that we can all agree on. And mm. it would be completely mechanical to see if a proof is correct or not. This is the notion that mathematical truth is objective, not subjective. You see, mm. 
mathematicians in their hearts, uh, you know, love this idea, even though it was refuted by Turing in 1931, uh, um, Gödel in 1931, Turing in 1936, and, uh, and I have my own versions using the notion of complexity. Yes. So, so it's an interesting philosophical tension between uh, between these two viewpoints, mm -hmm. um, and and mathematicians, in fact have gone ahead with uh, formal axiomatic systems in which you can develop a lot of mathematics and check it. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at Quantum, Mag Quantum Magazine in a recent uh, issue, they're talking about a number of people who have used a language called Lean and have taken all of undergraduate mathematics and formalized it and checked it mm -hmm. uh, using mm -hmm. uh, software done in Lean. and they even helped a Fields medalist w to check a, a proof of his, of a result which was very complicated and he was a little uncertain mm. and was asking for help if somebody could check it. And they, in fact, formalized it, put it into this formal axiomatic theory that they have. And the proof checker checked it, checked the proof and approved it. So, so so on the one hand, Hilbert's dream is still alive in the sense that mathematicians and computer scientists are working on formalizing all of mathematics and checking mathematics. The idea, yes. to put it more nicely, is to teach mathematics to a computer. Yes. But the computer doesn't invent mathematics. It, it understands mathematics that you explain to it, and it yes. can check yeah. proofs that you present to it. You give it a proof, and... It may say, okay, here, this is okay. The next thing is okay, I agree, I agree. And at some point it may say, oh, I don't understand. Can you, can you break this down for me in smaller steps? Can you explain this to me? Yes. So this is a sort of an interactive proof checker, this vision of having a library of mathematics that is formalized and checked. And this is a, this is a valuable uh, technology which is sure. being developed in spite of, interestingly enough, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Turing's version of it and the complexity verse version of it. So yeah. this is like in philosophy, you know, um, as Bohr said, there are ordinary truths where the opposite is obviously false. And then there are deep truths where the opposite also contains deep truth. So this notion of a formal axiomatic theory, in spite of there is no theory of everything for math, in spite of that, this vision has a great deal of power and, yes. and, and is valuable. But on the other hand, it's interesting to see results limiting the power of formal axiomatic theories, which is a sort of a self-criticism of mathematics using mathematical methods. This is yes. called metamathematics, because you're, you're applying mathematical methods to do, attempt to study what mathematical methods can achieve. Yes. So it's a, it's a paradoxical branch that, of mathematics which in a way is started by Hilbert, and the most famous result is Gödel's 1931 result, but the field has continued to develop since 1931. Yeah. Yeah. So all of this is related to ideas of, of Leibniz. I already referred to the idea that maybe the universe is a giant computer. Well, um, um, in in current quantum mechanics, the qu quantum mechanics, which comes from around 1920s in the previous mm. century, has sort of been redone in terms of computation and information. This is called quantum computation and quantum information. They've sort of reformulated quantum mechanics in, in that vocabulary. Mm -hmm. This is a very fertile area of research. It's also an attempt to create a new technology, which would be quantum computers, where you actually do quantum computation on what are called qubits, which is a quantum mechanical notion of a bit of information. It's sort yes. of a superposition of zero and ones. It's a mix. Yes. Yes. So, so, so this is a very active research area as theory and also in the attempt to create a qu quantum computer that is a usable working technology. But it's, 
it's a vision that goes pretty far. For example, um, there's, there's work of one theoretical physicist whose name escapes me at the moment to see if you can get space-time to emerge from qubits through Verlinda. Qubit. Verlinda, um, I believe. Yeah, that's 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 his name. That's his yes. name. So, so this is a uh, this is in, in, this is actually a uh, an area of research in in contemporary physics, and I believe, in, in my opinion, we can trace it back intellectually to the medallion that Leibniz designed. Um, uh, and um, so, so. Well, uh, if, if I can ask a question at this point, uh, yes. we're thinking of, of Leibniz's medallion as the zero and the one, and we can think of it as, right, as we do today, uh, it's representing off and on, right? So this is, this is all you need. Right with the bits, and so I forget the physicist name who invented the phrase, but bits uh, are its. Right, so the, the John Wheeler. It's John yes, Wheeler. Yes, Wheeler, and perhaps uh, perhaps it was from him, but I think uh, like Philip K. Dick, the the sci-fi uh, author, back in the fifties and sixties, and then into the seventies, he started writing a lot uh, in his fiction about the universe as information. Everything is information. So per perhaps he was pulling some of this from Wheeler. And, uh, but if we think uh, of, of bits as uh, so-called physical objects, right, uh, uh, comprising information or bits, right, so this is really of a piece, isn't it, uh, with Leibniz's uh, discovery of the binary system, I mean, with some qualifications, right? We can bring it all the way up to computers Right, which operate on zero and one, basically, right, um, on and off. Thanks initially to Turing and then his pioneering work. Uh, but um, is it that simple? Right, it's just zero and one. I think it is, but uh, it, it, uh, that's what most people would ask. It, can it really be that simple? Everything, right, uh, is from nothing, right, via the one. One. Uh, creates everything uh, with the zero. That's the way I would understand it. But uh, it, it's mind-boggling, even though it goes all the way back to Leibniz. I don't know uh, if we've really well comprehended it. This vision, this physics has not. Well, there. Are the, this vision has not been carried out. This is a program of research. Um, that is fertile. This is a point of view. It remains to be seen how far it can go, how fertile it is. Yes. Um, for now, real physics is, is mostly done in terms of space and time and matter and energy, mm -hmm. not in terms of information and computation. But mm -hmm. quantum computation and quantum information are already a big step in this direction, but you need to do more. Um, this idea that maybe you can get space time to emerge from some simpler substructure, mm. um, qubits with entanglement, for example, is an attempt to get everything to, to come out of information. Well, you would still have to get matter. That would give you maybe space and time in Verlinde's uh, work, but you would still have to see how to get matter. But you see, there's the idea also that maybe the universe is a simulation. I mean, maybe God is calculating, is simulating this universe in his, with a capital H, mind. Um, this is, a, um, you see, the idea is the laws of physics written in terms of partial differential equations um, generate the universe in a sense. This is classical yes. physics. Yes. But, but now, Instead of doing continuous mathematics, we think of calculations um, on a computer, and and so um, that's why Leibniz has remarked that as God cogitates and calculates, so the world is made. Um, 
the, the world could be a giant computation. Is the question is is the is the world a giant machine or is it a giant idea? If it's a giant <laughs> idea, this idealistic philosophy is 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 close to the notion of building everything out of information. So it's an old, it's a newer version of an old idea, idealism. Yeah. I think. So regarding the the problem of all right, so how do we derive matter? Right, which is Verlinda's remaining problem. Right, so how how do we demonstrate the origins of matter? Right, there's an interesting point that can be made there, uh, from a philosophical uh, perspective, and that is right, a lot of people today are are realizing that matter, ultimately, as far as our present understanding, is just as mysterious as consciousness, for example, right? And so there's the question of the relationship between consciousness and matter and uh, brings up the problem of Cartesian dualism and all of this and up. Uh, but, all right, so maybe we don't understand consciousness, but we don't understand matter either. And so we're really asking, how do we uh, derive matter? How do we show where matter comes from? But do we really even know what matter is? Right, so this this is taking it back to a, a, a more fundamental philosophical uh, level, I think. So it, it gives a little more weight, I think, in the meantime to Ferlinda. Right? Yes. Well, on the subject of consciousness, my own prejudice is in favor of panpsychism, that um, maybe everything is conscious, some degree of consciousness. Um, yes. Uh, I, I would agree, uh, and I would emphasize the maybe. I don't know, but that's a definite possibility, and uh, it's a suspicion. Uh, the way I've described it, um, I think after reading uh, one of those seminal essays by David Bohm, I forget the title of it, but um, I would say that when we look at, uh, let's say, primates or ourselves, right, we have a certain level of, quote-unquote, consciousness or awareness or ability to perform cognitive activity. All right, so if you look at um, simple celled um, organisms, I think even there, even though you don't see this uh, level of complexity, right, there's still some kind of processing, right, of sensory input, right? There's still some kind of processing going on. They may not be consciously aware, but they do react, right? to their environment, right? It may be at some level below what we call consciousness, but still I would put that, um, that very elementary level of, of sensory input, right? On the same continuum that at some point goes into self-awareness and, and higher degrees complexity of consciousness. But ultimately uh, I, I think it's on the same continuum, right? I suspect, I don't know, but I would suspect right. uh, that it all goes back uh, to to something to do with with that, all right? That it develops later. I think it, it complexifies immensely when you get organisms that have eyes, right? And then we're able then to have a spatial, a more of a, a deeply spatial relationship with the world. And this is a huge leap, I believe, right, in the... Um, cognitive capacities, right? So uh, panpsychism, uh, let's say, I, I think I would agree with what Chomsky said about it once, and that is it's a possibility. I don't know if it's correct, but it, it's it's definitely, uh, we can't demonstrate it, but we certainly can't disprove it right at this point. And there's, I would say there are certain ideas that maybe speak for it. So maybe it's starting to go towards the direction of probable rather than just possible because right anything is possible right well you know if you if you build the world out of space and time and matter and energy which is traditional physics then consciousness looks very mysterious how do you get consciousness now if you start with consciousness and information then on the other hand you have the problem how do you get matter and energy out of this viewpoint you know in space and time so if I can tell an anecdote, by the way, um, when Certainly. I was a young student, uh, I read about uh, a lot about fascinated with anecdotes about Gödel, and one of the anecdotes was that Gödel um, was fascinated by Leibniz, and at that time I had no idea why Gödel was fascinated by mm -hmm. Leibniz, 
And it, it went so far that uh, a friend of his from Vienna, Karl Menger, visited Gödel at Princeton and said, Gödel, you should stop. People don't want to read what you have to say about Leibniz. They want to read your, your work. You should stop studying Leibniz and you should st go back to doing research and publishing your own, your own work. Um, so, so I thought this was yet another sign of Gödel's eccentricity that he was spending so much time studying Leibniz. But um, now I uh, think on the contrary that Gödel was absolutely right. Leibniz is extremely fascinating. I also spent years uh, studying Leibniz and um, uh, uh, he ha Leibniz has an amazing mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, you, you anticipated most of the other questions I had, actually, right? The, which one of them was going to be, what's the relationship between simplicity and complexity, right, in relation to all this? And um, though I could revisit it, if, if uh, you, you would bear with me here, um, if you could just give us a few comments on how does your omega number right, fit into this idea of the interrelationship between the complexity and complexity. And then, of course, that's also related to uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So your, tell us what your omega number is in relation to that. Well, omega number is sort of a crystal of concentrated creativity. Um, that's the optimistic way of looking at it. You see, the whole business of the collapse, well, it hasn't collapsed completely. The collapse of Hilbert's dream, um, th th there's no theory of everything. You can look for mathematics. You can look at that positively or negatively, uh, optimistically or pessimistically. Um, the optimistic way to look at it, and I think Emil Post was the first person who said this, is what Gödel incompleteness means. The fact that there is no f fixed theory of everything for all of math means that mathematics is an open system, not a closed system, which means there's endless room for creativity in mathematics. This is the optimistic way of saying it. And um, in other words, a formal axiomatic theory gives absolute certainty, but it's sort of like a cemetery. You know, it doesn't leave much for our children and grandchildren to do in a sense. So, so what the omega number is, is um, a sort of an extreme example against Hilbert's notion that there could be a theory of everything for pure mathematics. It's a single number with a rather simple definition. It's the halting probability of a universal Turing machine, more or less, is what it is. And it's a probability, so it's a number between zero and one. And the definition mathematically is, is, is straightforward and rather simple. Um, but what is uh, paradoxical and intriguing about this number is that its numerical value, if, if you wanted to write it out in decimal or in binary, let's say you write it in binary, the numerical value of this number mm -hmm. um, between zero and one, it's a probability. Yes. The bits of this number look they are a perfect imitation in pure mathematics where all truths are necessary truths of contingent truths because each bit has to be a zero and one and it's a necessary truth, right? God, yes. In God's mind, it's a definite zero or one. It's not a mix. Right. Yes, yes. It's one or the other and that's it. But to us, it, it, looks, it looks just like independent tosses of a fair coin. It looks completely random. It looks completely chaotic. It, it is irreducible mathematical truth in the sense that to know the first 10,000 bits, the numerical value of this probability to 10,000 bits of accuracy, you would need a formal axiomatic theory with 10,000 bits of complexity. Yes. You see, it's irreducible. If you want, if you want, to know more of the value of the bits, you'd need every time a bigger and bigger formal axiomatic theory to enable you to prove what mm -hmm. the value of the bits are. So this is a sort of a nightmare uh, for the rational mind. Th these are irreducible truths, which are sort of in a way true for no reason, no reason simpler than themselves. Yes. So, so this is sort of a worst case. This is like a wall. This is a case where reasoning really doesn't help you at all. 
if you knew all the even bits, it wouldn't help you to, to determine what any of the odd bits are. If you knew the first million bits, it wouldn't help you to get the, the, the bits that come afterwards. Um, this is, um, so this is a sort of a worst case. This is a case where reasoning doesn't really seem to get you anywhere at all. So it's like a wall of unknowability. Now it's, I view it as a concentrated creativity. It's like a crystal of creativity. Yes. But so what I view this as is a positive result, not a negative result. One, the, the, the negative result is to say, well, there are cases where Hilbert is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Hilbert's vision of a single theory of everything for pure math applied to determining the numerical value of this number is, you know, um, you can only get a, a small number of bits. You can only determine by mathematical proof a small number of bits. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that sounds bad. But on the other hand, the, I think the right way to look at it is that what it, this is saying, because th these bits are very valuable information, actually, and they would enable you to determine, in principle, if you knew the first million bits, you would probably decide a lot of the open conjectures in pure math, mm -hmm. a, a lot of this is very valuable information. So in a way, what it means, it's not a wall. What it means is that mathematics, I, my interpretation, is an open system. And uh, it, it, now, th this doesn't go in the direction of absolute certainty in pure math. It, it goes in the direction that Imre Lakatos at the London School of Economics called uh, a quasi-empirical view mm. of mm -hmm. pure mathematics which is to say that pure math is not physics, it's not an experimental science, but it's not as totally different from an empirical science as mathematicians would like to think. It's sort of like a, a continuum, like a scale, mm -hmm. you see. Yes. And so that, that is my philosophical position regarding the significance of this number. Now, this number has some other interesting significance. You see, um, there's this this idea that all of the theoretical physics, if we knew all the equations, they would fit on a T-shirt, right? That you could sell to mm -hmm. undergraduates, right? The equations yes. of theoretical physics are simple and beautiful. And Hilbert thought that all of mathematics would fit on a, basically all the axioms and the rules of inference would basically fit on a, both sides of a T-shirt. But um, in biology, that's not possible. There is no equation for an elephant that tells you how the elephant works, right? Mm -hmm. or a human being or for an ecosystem. Biological systems are extremely complicated yes. and mathematical methods don't seem to apply too well to uh, equa mathematical equations, partial differential equations don't seem to apply too well in, in biology. So, mm -hmm. so biology, another way to put it, is the domain of the complex. Biological things are very complicated. So looking at omega from this perspective, I, I want to make a paradoxical remark that what omega shows, it seems to me, is that pure mathematics is even more biological than biology, you see, because biology is very mm -hmm. complicated, but omega is infinitely complicated, provably so. So in a sense, pure mathematics is even more biological than biology because it contains some infinite irreducible complexity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas biology just contains very large irreducible complexity. Now, the, ba based on that remark, which sounds like um, a, pro a provocation, <laughs> a philosophical provocation more than anything else, because it's a very strange remark to make, um, I started looking to see if I could come up with some kind of a mathematical analysis of the fundamental ideas in biology, not a theoretical mm. biology that is as mathematical as theoretical physics, because that's clearly impossible, but yes. it would be, uh, I wanted to call it metabiology. The idea would be to extract, try to extract the fundamental mathematical ideas in biology and see if one can play with them. So mm. that would be a, sort of a meta biology. It would not be a theoretical biology in the sense that theoretical physics describes very closely the physical world. This would be one step removed. And my proposal for creating such a theory 
was to run with an idea um, which was originally due to von Neumann. Uh, I believe it was in the 1940s, actually. Von Neumann has a beautiful paper where he, which is something, the title is something like The General and Logical Theory of Automata. And yes. um, he talks about natural autonoma and artificial autonom automata. Artificial automata are computers, we would say now. They were just beginning then. And what are natural automata? Well, they're biological organisms. Yes. Von Neumann is courageous enough to, to, to say this. And so this is the first appearance of the idea that maybe software is the essential common idea in computer technology and in biological organisms. And this idea, believe it or not, actually inspired one of the creators of molecular biology, whose name was Sidney Brenner, who shared an office with Crick for many years after Watson went back to the US. Sidney Brenner was originally from South Africa. He went to Cambridge to work on molecular biology, inspired by von Neumann's paper. Now, mm -hmm. Many of the physicists who created molecular biology were inspired by Schrodinger's book, What is Life? But in the case of Sidney Brenner, the inspiration was from von Neumann's paper, which as Sidney Brenner says, and I agree, in some ways is a deeper observation about the nature of biology than, uh, than Schrodinger's uh, little book. Yes. Uh, and so what, so th that's the idea that the that what the plasticity of computer technology and the plasticity of the biosphere are due to the fact that both are based on software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so try attempting to take this idea. So that's the idea. In other words, the DNA is the software of life. Yes. How it's put popular. So I thought about maybe taking this idea and trying to make a theory about what happens when you apply random mutations not to DNA, but what happens if you apply random mutations to computer software and trying to make a theory about that. So that would be an analogy with biology, but it wouldn't be biology. It's an attempt mm -hmm. to make sort of a toy model uh, taking this idea that DNA is software and seeing if this, if you can run with this idea mathematically and if if this is relevant to biology which it might or might not be so mm -hmm. this is a theoretic field that that I proposed called metabiology and managed to I managed to prove a few theorems um, um, my wife also I have a little book on this subject called proving Darwin and it doesn't actually prove Darwin. That was an attempt to have a title that would sell. Of course, yes. yes. It's a popular book, not an academic book. It was mm -hmm. published by a trade publisher, not an academic publisher. So the subtitle is more honest. It's making mathematic, biology mathematical, or more honest even would be attempting to make biology mathematical. So the, what I really call this is metabiology. My wife, has uh, Virginia Chaitin, has worked on this from a philosophical point of view. She's published and lectured on this. I have a PhD, a former PhD student who did a thesis on this topic very courageously called Felipe Abraham. And some of these ideas have also been picked up by Hector Zanil and his collaborators in Europe. And there was an article in Quantum Magazine about, about some of these ideas. Um, so all of this is this is uh, um, all of this is connected with with Leibniz. It's connected with Hermann Weil. Mm -hmm. It's connected with so in a way with Gödel incompleteness. The idea is to sort of take Gödel incompleteness and make it into a theory of biological creativity. So that's how mm -hmm. I would. Yes, what so I'm that's... trying to do with metabology, it's. My wife hates it when I say this. It's like a toy model of biology, of evolution. Mm -hmm. She prefers to say it's an attempt to extract the fundamental concepts from biology and develop them mm -hmm. mathematically. 
Well, anyway, so um, I'm sorry, I lost the thread again. Um, well, could, could we, uh, well, correct me if you need to, uh, but could we say that what you're hinting at there is that the biology is somehow a, a subset of the software and that software then can be correlated with information? Yeah, uh, Sidney Brenner says very clearly, uh, the revolution in molecular biology was to say, to hell with metabolism, to hell with energy in the cell. That was great work, the Krebs cycle, but to hell with it, let's forget about it. All we're interested in is information. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. the information is stored in the cell, how it moves, uh, what it tells us to do. That's the molecular biology revolution. All right. All right. And, and that's in tune with digital philosophy in a way. Mm. Yes, uh, yes. And with computer technology. Yes. So yes. digital philosophy, in a way, is responding to all of this and saying maybe, maybe we can do a, a unified worldview on this basis. Mm -hmm. In that case, we have to see if we can replace matter and energy by uh, information and algorithm right. As, right. Fundamental, right. as the fundamental concepts. And this has not happened, right. but is inspiring people. It's happened to the extent that there is now a very highly developed field, I've seen it develop over my lifetime, called quantum computation, quantum information and quantum computation. Yes. But it has not yet replaced all of, it has not yet based all of physics on the notion of, mm -hmm. of information and computation. Well, it would have to play a role in the, the attempt to reconcile the general relativity and quantum mechanics, the quantum physics. Which we're not yeah. Worried. Yeah. Well, I ha I have a a good friend uh, Stephen Wolfram, who has been working on related ideas. Another friend of mine who was a pioneer with digital philosophy. I think maybe he even gave it the name was Edward Fredkin. Mm -hmm. And and but but Wolfram and Fredkin uh, are using classical information, zeros and ones, not quantum information. Yes. Although mm -hmm. Wolfram is a very fine physicist. He started as a physicist. Um, and mm -hmm. he has actually uh, a proposal for models of physical universes, computational models, discrete computational models of physical universes, where he can show that you get something like quantum mechanics and you get something like general relativity. You get both. Mm -hmm. they're, in his models, they're compatible. Mm -hmm. And this is an amazing unification. You get something like the Feynman path integral and you get something like Einstein's field equations. So this is an alternative to string theory because it does unify quantum mechanics and general relativity. Now I've seen an essay, a recent essay by Stephen, and I think if I'm, if I'm not doing a disservice to, to Stephen's tremendous work in this area, um, He's already published a book on this topic, and he has lots of young collaborators. Mm -hmm. um, there is a problem with motion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can explain it in terms that I understand better. There was the von Neumann cellular automata model of the world, as um, the world divided into little squares, each of which has 29 states, and mm -hmm. uh, each the state of each cell depends according to a fixed rule on the state of its neighbors in the previous time. Time is discrete. And in this discrete cellular automata world, von Neumann constructed a computer, a universal Turing machine, that could copy itself, could reproduce itself. And so you see there uh, in this model of von Neumann's that was published posthumously, von Neumann left yes. Yes. complicated notes and um, um, you see, you see the, the, the DNA, something that's equivalent to DNA. Uh, von Neumann realized rather quickly that you had, to have, you, you had to have a description of the organism in the organism. Yes. That, that, that would be the software part. That goes back to his paper on a, um, what was it called? Um, the, the paper on autonomous. Uh, autonom logical logical a logical theory of of um of automata or no of i'm sorry i the name escapes me at this moment um so the problem 
in that cellular automata model, you, the machine, the computer can copy itself. It has the DNA that gives a description. It follows the instructions in the DNA to, to build part of itself. Then it copies the DNA, and that's how you do. This is what happens in the actual cell. And von Neumann realized that early on, that it had to be like this, this process, which is what happens. This is an amazing piece of mathematical foresight. But the problem is, the only way for an organism to move in the cellular automata world is to reproduce itself. Yes. So the organism wants to move, it has to make a copy, then the copy has to make another copy. This is not a very practical kind of motion. Mm -hmm. so, so this model is a very plastic ontology where... It's, a, it's it, in that sense, it looks very nice, but there are some problems. I believe that Stephen has realized, if I understand well, one of his recent essays, that in his model also, there's a little bit of a problem like that with, mm -hmm. with creating a macroscopic structure that can move. Yes. Um, well, it, it, in, a, in a future conversation, uh, maybe we can go uh, more depth into that. And the whole question of the the uh, challenge of the unification of general general relativity and quantum mechanics, uh, because then that that will take us somewhere else. But it, it is an area that I'm I would be interested in hearing your opinions about, and that would take us to uh, Einstein's famous uh, "God doesn't play dice," right? And then the, the whole question of uh, I think um, the, phys the the Dutch physicist uh, Gerard Te Hooft, right? He's uh, He's sort of still clinging to uh, Einstein's uh, sentiment there. And um, so there's this big question for me uh, about down the line, a generation from now, which we, we can't foresee, but, uh, you know, how, right, when, when the two are, are unified, if they can be, uh, where will randomness and determinism uh, how are we going to view the, the relationship between those two? And for instance, uh, random sequences, right, can also, of course, be uh, emerging from a set of rules, right, which are not necessarily random. So it, it's uh, going off somewhere else that we, we can uh, reserve for maybe a future conversation. But uh, I, I really appreciate your, your time today, Greg. This is really enlightening. And uh, Skip, you give me a lot to, to ponder. And um, it, it was a pleasure, Samuel. I'm sorry that my mind fogged. Uh, well, yes, as you moments. say, you're, you're uh, just getting over a, a flu or something. So, um, but more eloquent than most people who haven't had a flu. So, uh, you're very kind, Samuel. Yes. So, uh, so, so bravo. So, uh, everyone, uh, please be sure to uh, join us next time. Right. And, and until then, Take care and best wishes. If you enjoyed the program, please consider supporting this channel with a donation through Patreon or PayPal. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.